final item of business today is a member's business debate on motion number 11065 in the name of Linda Fabiani on 1010 October is World Mental Health Day. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put. And I'd invite those members who wish to speak in the debate to please press the request to speak buttons now or as soon as possible. Ms Fabiani, if you're ready, would you like to open the debate? Seven minutes, please, or thereby. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. And yes, I, I would like to open this debate because it's a very, very important debate. It's uh, something that matters every single day of our lives. But in fact, um, the motion mentions 10th of October because 10th of October was World Mental Health Day. And it's a very, very important day to reflect upon. It's a day of global mental health education, awareness and advocacy. We all um, have physical health and mental health to some degree. And uh, just like physical health, mental health does not discriminate uh, when it sends along problems. And there is so much uh, that is linked uh, into someone's mental health and sense of well-being. I think, firstly, I would like to welcome the work that this Parliament has achieved over recent years. In 2005, the Mental Health Care and Treatment Scotland Act 2003 came into practice, set in motion um, by the, the previous Labour and Lib Dem government and carried through by the SNP minority government, but backed by absolutely everyone in this Parliament. It was regarded as one of the most progressive pieces of mental health legislation in the world. And again, under the current government, there has been a big focus with the Mental Health Strategy 2012-15, to 15, setting out key commitments in relation to improving the nation's mental health and well-being. As I said earlier, like good physical health, good mental health cannot be assumed by anyone. Anyone at all can be diagnosed with a mental illness. Yet, unlike with many forms of physical illness and problems, <coughs> those with mental health problems clearly suffer from discrimination and from stigma. Prejudice and misguided stereotyping about mental illness it has to be tackled. So that's why charities like, for example, See Me are so important, because they tackle that stigma and all the disadvantages that are put upon people who suffer poor mental health. And of course, sensationalist media stories do not help either. We've all seen those, and I won't give them the dignity of repeating any of the terrible headlines that we've seen over the years here. I think, too, if we're all very honest, um, we have to admit that there are times our own language is perhaps not as good as it could be. I know I'm certainly guilty of that now and then. Um, but times move on, and terminology, which was perhaps normal and accepted years ago, is no longer perceived that way. So that's a way of moving on. Talking about uh, things like that, um, there are common misconceptions about many aspects of mental health. And World Mental Health Day 2014 shone the spotlight on schizophrenia. And around uh, one in 100 Scots experience schizophrenia at some point in their lives. It's uh, reckoned that 26 million people have that illness worldwide. And the major symptoms include hallucinations, delusions and fatigue. And of course, the word schizophrenia doesn't mean someone has a split personality or has multiple personalities, like the common usage um, has described over the years, both in real life and in depiction and TV, novels um, and film. So it is important that we raise awareness uh, of this condition. It's an important illness to raise awareness of. So widely misunderstood. And again, back to the, the sensationalising of stories in the mainstream media just exacerbates the problem of discrimination against those with schizophrenia. For example, regular misunderstanding that people with schizophrenia are violent, where the reality is that uh, people with mental illness are much more likely to be the victim of a crime than to be the perpetrator. And health inequalities for people with schizophrenia are alarming too. Uh, those with the illness are expect... Sorry, Sandra, I heard a wee voice in my ear, and there it was you. 
Sandra White. Thank, thank you, Presiding Officer, and I thank the member for taking the intervention. Uh, the member quite rightly you know, raised some issues there, but could I ask the member if she believes that one of the most important aspects of the mental health strategy is raising the awareness of mental health issues, particularly amongst professionals, as perhaps in the criminal profession, not in the criminal profession, the police, the justice, and even in doctors as well, uh, raising that awareness of people with mental health issues. I, I think Fabiana. that's absolutely right. I think there is institutional bias against people uh, who have mental health issues, and I think that very, very much has to be tackled. Um, and that feeds into the inequalities that we have. I mean, not, not just the health inequalities, those with the illness are expected to die 20 years younger than the average life expectancy, <coughs> and poor physical health is a major issue uh, facing people with schizophrenia and associated mental health problems too. But then there's the, the employment issue. Nine in 10 people with schizophrenia are not employed, despite most being able to work. And I think that's because of direct discrimination, misconception, both institutional and from the general public. Um, there's another issue too, which is sometimes people with schizophrenia are very reluctant to take help. Uh, I mean, I, I know that I've, over the years, um, you know, dealt with constituents, for example, who are suffering that institutional discrimination we're talking about and who have been uh, diagnosed with schizophrenia. And because of that terrible stigma that we put on it, they don't want to even say the word or talk to uh, professionals, in inverted commas, that it could indeed help them. So there's big issues there. I also think there's an issue about early diagnosis, and I do have concerns, and um, the Minister will be able to tell us more, I, I do have concerns about um, waiting times for child and young adult mental health um, referrals and being seen, and the early diagnosis kicks into that. In my motion, I mentioned Support in Mind Scotland, and that's a charity which focuses on supporting people with severe mental illness and their supporters. And in fact, locally, um, in my constituency of East Kilbride, there's been a support group there for over 35 years. And I've attended many of their events over the years. I've been representing that area. So another big shout out for Sheila McLeod and Eleanor Gardner. For 35, 36 years, these two women have been heading up that organisation. And that's back to what I said about the fact that uh, so often um, people don't want to speak to professionals. Um, that's where the voluntary sector really comes into its own and can gain the trust of people who really need that bit of help. I'm aware of the time, presiding officer, so I'll close here. I just want to mention another uh, constituency organisation, which is Theatre Nemo, because again, that confidence building and relationships building can come from drama, culture and the arts. So very important. So let's celebrate Support in Mind Scotland's 30th anniversary. Let's support their One in 100 campaign, which has just been launched. And uh, let's make yet another pledge here in this chamber that wherever we come across stigma and discrimination for mental health issues, we will stand against it. Thank you. Thanks so much. Now, Colin Malcolm Chisholm to be followed by John Mason. Four minutes. Yeah, also, I congratulate Linda Fadia on bringing the subject of mental health uh, to the Chamber in recognition of World Mental Health Day earlier this month. The motion points out that there is this year a particular focus on schizophrenia and the impact this mental illness has on the lives of individuals and families across Scotland and the wider world. And I'll stick to that particular uh, aspect, although obviously I agree with what Linda Fabiana said at the beginning of her speech about the, the Mental Health Act, uh, CME and other uh, initiatives. Which I th and I think there's been a great deal of continuity between uh, this and the previous government uh, on those developments. As she points out, the Support in Mind Scotland has been running now for 30 years and doing exceptional work in bringing the issues faced by sufferers into the public consciousness, challenging stigma and raising awareness. The first stage of their One in a Hundred campaign was launched earlier this month with a broad inquiry into people's experience of living with schizophrenia and the obstacles they face in navigating everyday life. Their efforts to reach communities in Scotland who have experience of coping with mental illness is commendable, reaching out to share best practice and learn from the experience of others. I notice they have a particular uh, interest in the 
English Schizophrenia Commission's report uh, on schizophrenia in England called the abandoned uh, illness. And I think some of the findings from that report are interesting. I don't know if uh, the Minister can comment on whether there are similar uh, features in Scotland. For example, premature mortality rates, that report says, for people with schizophrenia uh, are uh, dying 50, 15 to 20 years younger than uh, their, their, their fellow citizens. It also talks about poor employment outcomes, little support for families and significant fear to speak up because of stigma. So I imagine many of those features are also present uh, in relation to schizophrenia in Scotland. Uh, the group are keen to emphasise the mutual experiences of service users in Scotland and England on the basis of these findings, which present ample evidence for taking a more targeted approach to mental health services. They propose, and this is very interesting, to carry out a review of the report and the findings to consider what applies here in Scotland and what the response of policymakers should be. And to carry out this analysis, a small steering group of academics and professionals has been convened from across the NHS and other mental health networks. So I think that will be another uh, very interesting interesting report when it appears. The Mental Health Foundation have also taken a great deal of interest uh, in schizophrenia and they point out that around the world 26 million people live with schizophrenia. They are keen to highlight that the perceptions of mental ill health and schizophrenia are slowly changing and many who are asked state that in fact people with schizophrenia are not the danger to others once believed. So that's certainly progress, although there is still further to go and not least in the media. Moreover, if you're diagnosed with schizophrenia, they say, while it is a cause of concern, it should not mean that you lose the capacity to have a full and productive life. This can be helped by coordinating services more efficiently, which is one of the areas highlighted as an issue in the report on England previously mentioned. There needs to be a joined up approach to treatment and support, and this starts with early intervention and accurate signposting. Most importantly, the view that treating conditions like schizophrenia should be seen as being as important as treating physical conditions. Just because an illness is not visible does not mean it is any less critical. And without vital early diagnosis, a mental illness can very quickly lead to physical symptoms and also self-harm. Now, one of the worrying features, of course, is that people with schizophrenia and indeed other uh, mental uh, uh, illnesses often uh, are not looked after as effectively in terms of their other uh, uh, more straightforwardly physical uh, health. Um, the motion today speaks of the one in every hundred people who have a life expectancy of 15 to 20 years less because of their mental illness. This enormous disparity tells us all we need to know about the serious challenges faced in terms of improving outcomes for those with schizophrenia. The worsening mental health of each individual affected should not come at the cost of deteriorating physical health. A paper published last year in the British Medical Journal by Glasgow University's Dr Daniel Smith concluded that, and I quote, people with schizophrenia have a wide range of comorbid and multiple physical health conditions, but are less likely than people without schizophrenia to have a primary care record of cardiovascular disease. This suggests a systematic under-recognition and under-treatment of cardiovascular diseases in people with schizophrenia, which might contribute to substantial premature mortality observed within this patient group. In short, this suggests that people are dying earlier because of delayed diagnosis. Now is the time to recognise this kind of link and to make a pointed attempt to achieve the more preventative approach the mental health strategy sets out to do. I support the motion and welcome World Mental Health Day's focus on this much misunderstood condition. Many thanks. Now call on John Mason to be followed by Mary Scanlon. Uh, thank you, uh, Presiding Officer, and thank you to Linda Fabiani for bringing up uh, this subject. I have to say, when I saw the title, I was very keen uh, to speak in the debate, as it has become increasingly clear to me uh, that mental health is a major issue we face and needs more attention. For example, recently in my own constituency, a care home was proposed, and folk in the community were broadly happy that that should go ahead, assuming it was for elderly or similar residents. It then turned out it was to be for folk with mental health issues, and there was a fair degree of reaction in the community, with concerns about the residents being a danger, and a lot of misinformation eh, was spread around. Now, the company has a... Eh, eh, building the home has given us a lot more information now, and I would say that most eh, constituents are reassured by that. But I have to say there has been a hard core in the area who have not been willing to listen. Routinely, we have constituents come into my office about housing or other problems, but my staff and myself often feel there is a mental health angle to it. And I would like to say I have, I'm particularly grateful to GAMH, SAMH and CME eh, for the advice, information and support that they have given. 
However, this was really underlined to me last week when I had three issues in the constituency, all of which made it into the media and all of which had a mental health angle. Firstly, I have a family where the 19-year-old daughter has anorexia and relations between the NHS staff and the family have become somewhat fraught. Now, I'm convinced that all involved want the best for this young woman, but we are struggling to get the meeting of minds on how to move forward. And sadly, one person was actually arrested last week involved in the case. Now, I was very glad to say, see today that the Evening Times on pages 12 and 13 it had a, a spread on anorexia uh, and mentioned see me as part of that and the headline anorexia had wrecked my body but even worse was the stigma uh, this is a story it has to be said with a positive outcome uh, bravely Anne has battled to a normal weight and is now backing mental health campaign uh, which is encouraging the second case uh, which also had a fair amount of coverage was between a well-known female writer and her ex-partner who is a musician and is one of my constituents. Now, I would most certainly agree that we should have adequate laws in place to protect actual and potential victims of stalking, and I'm happy if the law is to be reviewed. But we have to have a balance with our responsibilities to the other party in this case, and in such cases, who might have a mental health issue. And often that person is not acting out of malice, uh, and I, I do accept that, uh, well, I do not accept that one suggestion that was made that anyone uh, challenged with uh, a stalking charge could say that they have a mental health problem. I think that in itself is to play down mental health issues as if they did not have an objective reality. So I very much hope there will be no rush to change legislation without taking all angles in this into account. Uh, if it's brief, yes. Welcome to Zoom suggesting that someone should have to uh, suffer appalling behaviour from someone just and, that, and be excused on the grounds of mental health problems. There's a debate there as to you know, how appalling and there's a whole range. I mean, there's stalking that is malicious, but there is stalking that is just stupid and unwise and as a result of mental health issues. And I think that is slightly more of what we had there. Third, the third case is the Belgrove Hotel in my constituency, which some members may be aware of. It is really a hostel for homeless men rather than a hotel and is one of the last large homeless hostels in Glasgow. But it's run by a private company and so avoids the care inspectorate and most other regulation. Last week it received a new HMO license for 160 residents. It generally has about 140. Now my understanding is that a number of these men have mental health issues and are regularly in contact with the local mental health team in Parkhead. I cannot believe that the Belgrove is the right place for them to be and also I cannot accept that the only regulation it needs is an HMO license. What it says to me again is that we are not taking mental health in this case seriously enough. So all of these examples say to me that we are not taking mental health seriously enough. And just to mention one point which Malcolm Chisholm also mentioned uh, that particularly struck me in the motion was this about uh, 15 to 20 years less life expectancy. So please nobody should say to us that this is not a real and serious health issue. Thank you. Thanks. I now call on Mary Scanlon to be followed by Stuart Stevenson. Thank you, President Officer. I, I would also like to thank uh, Linda Fabiani for securing this debate on World Mental Health Day and for giving us the opportunity to debate the critical issue that is mental health. Uh, in response uh, to um, Sandra White, Linda mentioned um, uh, early diagnosis and institutional uh, uh, issues. But I would also say that for many people, it's not only early diagnosis, for many people, it's a lack of diagnosis. Um, so although the motion shines a spotlight on schizophrenia, many issues relating to this condition also apply to most other mental health uh, conditions, including difficulties getting employment, discrimination and stigma, shortened life expectancy, as other members have said, and so much more. And whilst the motion highlights the work of the East Kilbride Support Group, I would also like to acknowledge the work of HUG, the Highland Users Group on Mental Health, which is very competently managed by Graham Morgan. But as a member of the Health Committee, which scrutinised the Mental Health Care and Treatment Act 2003, with nearly 3,000 amendments at stage two, I actually hoped that significant improvements in early diagnosis, early intervention, appropriate treatment and support, not just parked on antidepressants, 
access to CBT, cognitive behavioural therapy and other therapies, psychology and psych psych psychiatry specialists, advocacy and treatment with dignity and respect. I actually hoped and trusted that all of these issues that we discussed in the first session of this Parliament would be significantly improved 10 and more years later. However, when I looked at a recent briefing paper from the Royal College of Psychiatrists, I actually doubt the progress and the success of the previous legislation. The Royal College of Psychiatrists paper, uh, and I quote directly from the paper, uh, Despite, without my glasses, uh, despite its long-standing position as a priority within health policy, it remains the case that mental health services do not receive the same degree of focus for funding as other diseases. Secondly, mental health is responsible for 23% of the disease burden, uh, yet it gets 11% of the budget. The life expectancy of those with severe mental health on average 20 years less for men and 15 years less for women. Uh, depression is associated with a 50% increased mortality, a threefold increased risk of death uh, in subsequent years uh, in uh, coronary heart disease, and also the disparity in research funding, which particularly applies to schizophrenia, uh, one of the UK funders on health research showed that mental health got 6.5% of total funding, despite it being 23% uh, of, of patients who suffered from that. The recent Health and Social Care Act for England sets parity for mental health and physical health. And I would be thrilled to bits if that was the case, and I hope it will be, in this Parliament. And so often, especially Richard Simpson and others, we spoke about dual diagnosis, people with mental health and also uh, drug addiction and alcohol addiction. And we know that many people use alcohol and drugs as self-medication to mask and cope with mental health issues. And here it is again in the Royal College of Psychiatry paper. And then they talk about uh, for older people and dementia, access to psychological and other services is much poorer for older people and they, they make plenty points but they're still seeing the college is concerned at the lack of adolescent intensive psychiatric care units for young people uh, with, uh, with need for this that are required to be admitted to adult units. Now I have to say Oh, sorry, and also the consultant vacancies in psychiatry, and I appreciate psychiatrists are not the only specialists, but it is disappointing to read all the issues raised in this paper from the Royal College, given that they were all raised 11 years ago when the mental health legislation was passed by this Parliament and implemented uh, later. But finally, presiding officer, I just wanted to mention the experience, as others have mentioned, about trying to help constituents find support, particularly in relation to personality disorders. The time taken to diagnose this condition and indeed the need to look at the transition from child to adult services is very, very poor indeed. And I think I've probably overstepped my time, so I'll leave it there. But I'm pleased to have the opportunity to speak in this debate and thank Linda Fabiani. Thanks very much. Now I call on Stuart Stevenson to be followed by Liam MacArthur. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer, and thank you very much to Linda Fabiani. Um, let's make this personal. Statistically, every one of us here has a 50-50 chance that at some time in our life, somebody whom we have a direct one-to-one -one relationship with, in a familial sense, will suffer mental ill health. That's two parents, a partner, and a single offspring, which statistically is what we have as relationships. So it will be close to home. I, I've only discovered in the last year, for example, uh, that one of my mother's aunts uh, lived most of her life locked away in the asylum in Loch Gilpet. Never talked about Never spoken about, I never knew she existed until I was doing some family research. And that was the past, that was the stigma. It happened and it simply wasn't talked about. I um, 
very much enjoyed in 1964 working for some six or seven months in a psychiatric hospital uh, as a nurse, as a 17-year-old before going on to university. It was a time when the treatment was, if you were seriously mentally ill, you were locked in a ward and forgotten about. Um, the staffing levels were appallingly poor. The world today is very different, and let's hope that that is good. Now, let's just talk about a few things. Awareness. What does it mean for the sufferer? Because not all people who suffer from mental ill health are self-aware that they have a problem. We can't do much about that. But what we can do, the family and everyone else, is by being aware of the needs of that person, be there to support them when they need it, be there to catch them when they fall, be there to lift them back up when they need it. Treatment. There's health treatment we need for people with mental ill health, and we're increasing investment in that, and that's very welcome. Albeit, as Mary Scanlon correctly highlighted, it's still very much the poor relation financially, but also, more critically, the poor relation in terms of being a chosen specialism for people with medical training. And I think that's even more critical than money. Because if we don't have the people with the skills, we can't actually spend the money to help the people who need it. I think we all have to be careful about the social interactions we have with people with degrees for mental ill health. But let's put a positive spin on some of this. Because having a different mental approach to things although it creates a huge burden for people, can deliver benefit. And I want to just highlight the careers of three famous schizophrenics. First of whom is Vincent van Gogh. Now, he died at the age of 37, and he did so, it is thought, because he shot himself. Now, um, this is not the place to explore why there's doubt about that. Uh, but he produced the most wonderful impressionistic art. And there's little doubt that the way his brain and his mind worked was a contributor to that. But he paid a huge price for that, but he delivered a great deal for us, which we remember to this day. Clara Bow, the It Girl, one of the first stars in the silent cinema and continued on into uh, the era of the talkies. She suffered from schizophrenia for her entire life, but contributed enormously to the experience and enjoyment of others. Nijinsky, the great uh, dancer, was schizophrenic, and like Clara Bow, died relatively early at the age of 60. Many of these people were in the artistic uh, domain rather than science uh, or, or, or other domains, but there are many, many others that one could speak about. Let's remember that people with mental illness are there and can make a huge contribution, sometimes aided uh, by the fact that they, they have that mental illness. Now, we talk about stress in our modern society. And stress is actually good as long as it pushes us forward within our ability to deal with the stress. But for too many people in the complex world in which we live, stress gets overloaded and becomes distress and can lead to mental ill health. And we have to, each and every one of us, be watching for that to happen. And in particular, presiding officer, let me just conclude by saying, ultimately, of course, one of the outcomes from some people's mental ill health is suicide. And I, in my life, have been unfortunate to be close to three different people who've committed suicide. One uh, who, who did so because of a, a chemical imbalance arising from a physical condition that led to suicide at the age of 18, I may say. Uh, another who, uh, uh, suffering postnatal depression, uh, threw herself off a high building. And the third one, to this day, no sign of suicide coming. To this day, we do not know why the suicide took place. This is a mystery wrapped in an enigma, but we all individually have a duty uh, to help people with mental ill health, to guide them to treatment, to make sure that we as parliamentarians provide the resources to help them. Presiding officer. Many thanks. I now call on Liam MacArthur to be followed by Mark MacDonald. Hey, thank you. Deputy Presiding Officer, can I uh, start like others by congratulating my good friend Linda Fabiani in giving us this opportunity uh, to rather belatedly mark uh, World Mental Health Day, uh, which, as others uh, have said, focuses on uh, the area of schizophrenia uh, this year. And I think that gives me an opportunity to commend also support in Mind Scotland uh, for their excellent One in 100 campaign. Um, I, 
again, this is, a, this is just the latest debate we have on the issue of mental health. Um, I was very fortunate to take part in the debate led by my Liberal Democrat colleague Jim Hume back in April. Uh, I may return to one or two of the points I made uh, on that uh, occasion. Um, but it struck me during the course of that debate that uh, many, if not all of the, the, the members across the chamber who contributed, were, were doing so by drawing on uh, some element of, of personal experience. And I think Stuart Stevenson rightly uh, drew us back to that kind of uh, approach in, in, in this debate. And it, should, it came as no surprise. The, the, the figures um, from Sam H and others suggest that one in four uh, would suffer from a mental illness at some point through their life, that three out of four of us uh, will know somebody uh, fairly directly uh, who suffers from poor uh, mental health. And mental illness remains the dominant health pr uh, problem for people of working age. It continues to damage careers, uh, relationships and lives and comes at a colossal financial as well as uh, human cost. I, I think, as, as Linda Fabiani fairly uh, observed, there has been a succession of initiatives over many years in successive administrations. And I would certainly like, again, to congratulate the current government on the mental health strategy, which I think um, uh, has waiting time to target, uh, places an emphasis on data collection, both of which I think are absolutely uh, fundamental to ensuring uh, timely delivery uh, and diagnosis uh, and, and effective treatment thereafter. And that, uh, treatment can safeguard the welfare of the individual in the first instance. And without offering any guarantees, it also increases the chances of that person enjoying good mental health uh, subsequently. But however encouraging early signs of progress towards meeting those targets have been, I think there are aspects of recent figures that suggest uh, there are cause for some concern. I think Mary Scanlon pointed to some of those. At a regional level, we're seeing variations between health boards that Sam H um, earlier this year suggested were giving rise to a postcode lottery. For example, additional experts uh, have been recruited, but the evidence of significant variations in the per, per capita ratio of psychologists in different parts of the country is, I think, a cause for concern, particularly in rural areas. And as I said in, in, in the debate in April, um, Sam H and uh, Nowhere to Go campaign found that people living in remote and rural areas face additional barriers to accessing information, help and support. A culture of self-reliance and stoicism in places uh, like Orkney can work against efforts to get people with health issues, including poor mental health, to engage early with medical professionals. Uh, even where the wider community is a source of support, this can almost make things more difficult and increase the fear of stigma, not just in relation to the individual, but also their wider family. And the result is that de delays in getting people um, to seek help for mental health problems, uh, as Sam H um, explained, the later individuals engage with health services, the more complex their treatment and recovery uh, will be. In the islands I represent, there are additional practical, difficulty as, uh, practical difficulties as well. The Blyde Trust and Orkney Minds, who do fantastic work, highlight a lack of transfer beds at the Balfour Hospital for those who may require uh, a spell of hospital on the mainland, uh, or instances of poor discharge uh, planning affecting patients returning to Orkney. And while those involved in the mental health team in Orkney carry out phenomenally good work, there is an opportunity uh, with the move to the new Balfour Hospital the further integration of health and care services in the islands to look at how the needs of those with mental health uh, patients can be addressed uh, more uh, timiously and more effectively. And this, I'm sure, will be the focus of an event the Blind Trust are organising next month uh, and in which uh, I am looking forward to taking part. So the stakes are high. Uh, Sam H highlights suicide rates that are twice as high as those with mental health issues. As Stuart Stevenson observed, I think each of us probably have um, some uh, knowledge of a close friend. In, in my case, um, a, a guy called Andrew Harrison that I, I worked with in, 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 in Westminster back in the early 90s, committing suicide almost out of the, 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 the blue. Um, and those rates are not, uh, they're not unusual. The, the mortality rates as Linda Fabian in Fabiani in her motion uh, alludes to, are far, uh, far uh, higher for those with mental health issues. I was noticing a report uh, from uh, in the British Journal of Psychiatry, a, a Nordic study. Could you draw to a close, please? Even with, even with improvements, what we're seeing is far, far higher rates of uh, mortality. It's just one of the reasons why I think mental health needs to be put on a similar footing uh, to physical health. As I said in April, this is an issue that needs to be discussed openly, taken seriously and addressed effectively. It's not a second-class condition, and 
ultimately there is no good health without good mental health. So again, in closing, I welcome the fact that Linda Fabiani has brought this debate and look forward to the Minister's uh, response. Thank you very much indeed. Many thanks. Now I call on Mark MacDonald, after which we move to the closing speech of the Minister. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, I think it's been a very interesting debate so far, and um, I take on board the point that Stuart Stevenson makes. Um, one of the people who's been a very strong influence on me in terms of uh, my interest in, in mental health issues is a, a former council colleague of mine, Councillor Jim Kiddy, who um, is a representative of, uh, of Tory and Ferry Hill on Aberdeen City Council. And Jim has spoken openly uh, in the council chamber and at uh, SNP conferences in the past about his own uh, issues with mental health and his own mental health problems and um, I think uh, Jim has been a, a fantastic champion on issues related to uh, mental health uh, and also has uh, inspired those of us who take an interest in these issues and um, I too uh, recognise the, the points that Stuart Stevenson made. I mean one, one in every four of us uh, will likely experience uh, a mental health problem at some stage in our lives. Um, and that emphasises further the point that Stuart Stevenson made about those in our, our uh, social networks, our family networks as well. Um, uh, one of the things that, that always strikes me, um, aside from the stigma issue and the fact that still to this day, nine out of ten people are reporting that they feel that there is a stigma attached to them revealing a mental health condition, whether that's in work, education, uh, with, with healthcare professionals or uh, in their own home life, uh, is the fact that um, often there's a, 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 a cartoon that is shared on social media that compares how, um, how things would be if we treated physical health in the way that we treat mental health in society. You know, have you tried not having a broken arm? Um, maybe you should try cheering up a bit and that will stop the bleeding. That is essentially the realms that we would be in if we spoke in the way that we do about mental health often, about physical health. Now, it's worth noting that um, Halloween is just around the corner and uh, Halloween is one of those times when I think it's fair to say that mental health is probably at its most misrepresented. Um, who could forget the controversy that was created just the other year with uh, some major supermarket chains having to withdraw what were um, very inappropriate costumes, uh, mental patient costumes, uh, which were designed to uh, perpetuate in some ways the stigma that people with mental health conditions are dangerous. Um, it is uh, almost uh, without foundation, um, but it has continued to be perpetuated by some elements of the media that somehow if people have a mental health condition they become dangerous. One of the things that I think we also need to focus on beyond um, how we treat um, mental health in terms of um, both recognising the, the needs of the individual is also how we look to future treatments that could be realised because um, one of the things that I found while um, flicking through the news earlier in the year was research that had been undertaken at Aberdeen University which has identified a potential genetic mutation of the, of the ULK4 gene which could be linked to schizophrenia. Now there is more work that needs to be done uh, and the academics behind this at the, at the University of Aberdeen's medical science uh, department have said there is more work that needs to be done but they are encouraged by the work that they've done uh, which could enhance uh, understanding uh, of how schizophrenia takes form uh, in those individuals who are affected by it but also there is always the potential then if we have identified uh, potential genetic mutations um, and genetic markers to also look at how future treatments for the condition may be informed as a result of that. So I think it's important uh, that we recognise the work that is being done by the many organisations across Scotland to raise awareness and to tackle stigma. But also we must recognise the work that is being done across Scotland by uh, our dedicated medical professionals and researchers to try and get to the bottom of how uh, conditions such as schizophrenia take form and to hopefully then work on treatments for the future which can help uh, tackle this at a much earlier stage. Many thanks. And we now move the closing speech from Minister Michael Matheson. Minister, seven minutes or thereby, please.
Thank you, President Officer. Can I, uh, like others, uh, begin by offering my congratulations to Linda Fabiani in securing time for uh, this debate in uh, recognising World Mental Health Day, which was um, uh, a few weeks ago. Um, I also uh, welcome the fact we're having a debate on mental health, and I think as um, several speakers, Lee MacArthur, made mention of the fact that we've had regular debates in this Parliament on uh, mental health issues. And um, although there are uh, very often a lot of focus around the services which are provided by the statutory sector, uh, or health service in particular, there's also a tremendous amount of work that's undertaken by third sector organisations in helping to support individuals uh, with uh, mental uh, illness, including uh, Support in Mind Scotland uh, and uh, the volunteers that uh, Linda Fabiani made reference to uh, in their East Kilbride uh, support group. And part of the work that we take forward as a, a government is to support organisations like Support in Mind, uh, which we presently financially support over a, a three-year uh, financial programme to 2017 to help them to deliver some of our shared objectives. Um, of improving well-being and the uh, quality of life for people affected by mental illness. Now, the challenge is uh, very clear, presiding officer. Mental illness is uh, one of the top public health challenges in Europe. It's estimated that mental health uh, disorders affects more than a third of the population uh, every year, and people with mental disorders have a much higher mortality rate than the general population, dying on average uh, more than 10 years earlier. Uh, than uh, others, uh, a point which was referred to by uh, Malcolm Chisholm in his own contribution. That is why, uh, as a government, mental health is one of the Scottish Government's clinical priorities. Uh, our priorities in this area are taken forward as part of our mental health strategy and the 36 uh, commitments which have been set out within uh, the existing mental health strategy. Within the sector, there is a broad consensus that the approach that has been set out in the mental health strategy uh, is uh, the right one uh, and it can help to deliver uh, further improvements in the services which we all wish to see uh, happening on a consistent uh, basis. Uh, one of the areas which I am keen to see uh, further progress in is to help to reduce the variation and availability of services and to increase the pace of change and in the delivery of quality uh, mental health services for those who need them. It may be helpful, President Officer, if I outline to some of uh, uh, the members here today uh, the progress that has been made uh, as part of the commitments which were set out within the mental health strategy. There are already uh, seven commitments which have been, of course, I'll give way Liam to Mr MacArthur. MacArthur. To the Minister for taking an intervention, and, and uh, I think, as I said in my own remarks, I, I very much welcome the approach taken by the strategy. But you'll recall the exchange we had in the debate in, in April about um, the legal status or priority attached to mental health as, um, as compared to, to, to physical health. And do you not believe that perhaps a signal that that would um, serve in terms of parity uh, within the law might address some of the, pr the, the issues that Stuart Stevenson was recognising about the, the, the pointer it would give to people in terms of the disciplines that they would pursue uh, through, uh, through higher education and indeed the, the research funding, etc., that would go into uh, those, uh, those sorts of conditions? Well, uh, let me uh, come to that point slightly later on in some of the issues I want to address, uh, because I want to just go through a couple of the issues around the uh, policy which have been set out within the mental health strategy, because the Mental Health and Treatment Act is probably not the right basis in which to measure the progress that's been made, because the legislation is not there for the purposes of ongoing operational uh, policy purposes. But it might be helpful if I can set out uh, some of the progress that's been made and turn to some of the points which I intend to that Mr MacArthur uh, raised. Uh, there are seven uh, commitments which have already been completed uh, and uh, with uh, uh, the remainder well underway uh, are scheduled for work in 2015. Uh, and uh, although there's not time to cover all of these areas, I want to go into a few of them. One of them is in the issue of tackling stigma uh, and discrimination, which a number of members have made reference to in the uh, CME uh, campaign, Scotland's anti-stigma and anti-discrimination uh, uh, programme. That's a programme uh, which is hosted on behalf of the Scottish Government by uh, uh, the Scottish Association for Mental Health and the Mental Health Foundation. It was refounded. It was principally focused on stigma and it has been extended to not only deal with stigma but also discrimination. And in a partnership that we forged with, the, uh, with Comic Relief, uh, funding has gone from £1 million a year to £1.5 
million pounds a year. So that's allowed us to significantly increase the level of funding which goes into uh, this area. And in refounding it, a key part of it is around looking at areas where people have particular experience of discrimination and stigma, in particular in the workplace and also in accessing health and social care uh, services. And that's why we're given a particular focus as part of the new campaign to make sure that they focus in, in these areas. Uh, Linda Fabiani and others have raised the issue about the challenge that individuals with uh, uh, mental ill health can experience in being able to uh, gain access to employment. Again, that was a key commitment which was set out within the mental health strategy. We have the stakeholders group, which is made up of the Scottish Government, health, local authorities, the DWP, third sector, specialist employment providers uh, who are drawing together a report with recommendations to the Scottish Government uh, on work, what works for mental health in employability in order to look at what measures we can take further in order to improve employment opportunities for those with mental illness. Now, I want to uh, turn to another point that was raised as well, and that was raised by uh, Linda Fabiani around uh, CAM services, child and adolescent mental health services. And also to pick up a particular point that Mary Scanlon made about what she feels is a lack of any improvements taking place. Mary Scanlon was on the health committee with myself in the last parliamentary session when we investigated the whole issue of access to child and adolescent mental health services. And at that point, we found there were significant deficiencies in being able to access child and adolescent mental health services. So what has happened since 2008? We have set the heat target for faster access to child and adolescent mental health services to 18 weeks, which applies as of December uh, this year. What we have we seen over those uh, last couple of years, we've seen a significant increase in referrals and uh, a number of individuals, uh, the numbers of individuals being treated have increased uh, significantly. We have started to see waiting times on average for these services across the country to be between eight and 10 weeks, which is a significant improvement on inquiry which the health committee undertook into this area. And we've also saw significant financial investment into this area. Since 2009, there's been an additional 13 and a half million pounds invested into children and adolescent mental health services. Why has that also resulted in a 45% increase in the workforce within the CAM service itself. Because one of the things that the committee identified was a lack of staff within the child and adolescent mental health services. Now, that's not to say that everything is right in this area and that we don't have waiting times in some areas which are still far too long. But what we are seeing is a general level of improvement taking place. What we want to do is to make sure that we build on that yet further. And we also applied the uh, waiting times, uh, the 18 week waiting time for access to psychological therapies as well. And the reason we set that waiting time target for psychological therapies, which again comes into force as of uh, uh, this uh, December, was to create the parity which we have with physical services in a way, in a way, can I just finish this point, in a way that has not been applied anywhere else in the UK. Now, having something that states something in a bit of legislation doesn't mean you deliver parity. Parity is delivered by the policy that you deliver on the ground. And that's why Scotland is the only part of the UK that has so far set a target for accessing mental health services, which is equal with that of physical health services. I'll give way to Mary Scanlon. Uh, thank you, and I do remember the, the, the days on the health committee when uh, you were uh, you weren't a minister. Um, uh, can I just say I said that uh, progress was disappointing, but it, it would uh, it, it would be absolutely wrong to say there'd been no progress. I can remember the days when it was years uh, rather than months and weeks. But uh, everything I quoted today in the lack of progress came from the Royal College of Psychiatry, who were uh, very vocal. But in the first, uh, the mental health. Uh, uh, legislation. But can I just, I didn't have time to mention the fact that although you can uh, see a mental Please. health specialist within a certain time, they also said that 5,300 children uh, at June this year are still waiting to access treatment in this service. That causes concern. I, I think I don't want to give the impression, that, as I said, that everything is uh, as is, uh, good as we would wish it to be. But what we are is a, is, a, is a process of improving these services, and we want to maintain that 
and that is what the mental health strategy sets out. But I do think you would agree that it would be wrong to give the impression that no improvement had taken place and that we were not making progress in improving in this area as well. Can I also uh, turn I as well to, to rush, other points? If, you draw to a close, if I can, just it was points which were raised by uh, Malcolm Chisholm, particularly around uh, life expectancy uh, and also uh, poor, poor employment opportunities. I mentioned the commitment we'd set out in the uh, mental health strategy about trying to improve employability uh, and opportunities and the work that we're taking forward in that. And the mental health strategy also addresses that second point around uh, life expectancy and some of the work which we're doing in that area. So, and also, can I just finish on this particular point, which I think members would find uh, very useful? We are going to be uh, publishing a 10-year review report, uh, which will provide us with uh, an opportunity to obtain a national picture of Mental Health Services Scotland from uh, 2003 to 2013, so that we can see where the challenges remain, but where the progress has also been made. And we should have that report by the end of this year, and hopefully we should be able to publish it early in the new year, which I've got no doubt will help to inform members about where the areas of work that need further progress can be undertaken. But, President Officer, can I assure member that this, members that this is an area which continues to be uh, of priority to the Scottish Government and will continue to build on the progress we have made in recent years. And I do welcome uh, the particular interest that so many members in this chamber show in the area of mental health. Many thanks. And thank you all for this excellent debate. I close this meeting of Parliament.